you've obviously caught the the theoretical um, idea of what efficiency is, and you'll find that uh, possibly uh, in my business, efficiency comes in a, a different series of formats. Um, I took the, the dictionary definition of efficiency because that's what I was asked to speak about today. And uh, I suppose one of the bit that amuses us all is it includes personal time and energy. Um, in our business, I'm going to explain a little bit of the background to our business. And in our business, we've got four main enterprises in it. Um, we have about a thousand uh, breeding sheep. We rear um, three to four hundred replacement new lambs, some of which we put into lambs. So they are producing some product some of the time. So some of them uh, in Stuart's analysis would be highly inefficient, but they have a different purpose. They were too small at the time that uh, came to mating. We also grow about se uh, 750 acres of cereals and all of that is used both winter barley, spring barley and um, uh, winter wheat are put into pig feed. So all of our cereals goes into pig feed for our business. This is a feed mill that we built this year and all of our grain goes into that and is used for our own feeding plus, plus a lot of other. Our own grain lasts about six weeks just to give you a feeling of it. Um, we also produce energy, uh, so we've spent a lot of money recently on um, installing a wind turbine. Was that, that was put up five years ago. And so e energy is, is a, an important part of our business. But the biggest part of our business, the core of our business, is pig production. We produce about 65,000 pigs a year. We produce pigs for a breeding company, a UK breeding company. We're producing pigs for breeding to export. For UK farmers, the export market comes and goes depending on the currency and the economics of uh, different countries at different times. And we're selling primarily female pigs into that market, although we do send males uh, into, into uh, these different markets from time to time. But a large proportion of the product ends up as meat production. So we have to make sure there's a kind of compromise in a sense between uh, animals which are more efficient for breeding would tend to be carrying a higher level, I'll just pop that back a second, uh, would be carrying a higher level of back fat, but it's important because of such a high proportion of animals going into the meat market that we retain that level of balance. So efficiency is curtailed to some extent, you could say, in that respect. Now, please note, this is um, an enterprise turnover. It's not our total company turnover, which is considerably less than that. So it's an aggregated accumulation of enterprise uh, profitability, uh, not profitability, turnover. And um, it would be nice if it were profitability. <laughs> um, you can see that the large uh, green part is a, is a pig part of our enterprise. And the blue part, the, the ready purpley bit, is the new feed mill. So the feed mill is accounting for something like four to four and a half million pounds turnover. Now that was always included in our pig enterprise before, but it's now been split off as a separate enterprise uh, for the business. Time will judge whether this new mill that we've constructed, which produces about 1,200 tonnes of feed a year, uh, will generate a good return. But the hope is that if we manage it efficiently and we do our job properly, and we do it better than a commercial feed mill would do, then there's a potential, at least, for us to return some margin back to the business itself. The second largest little wedge, the, the, the biggest of the little wedges is our serial enterprise and the second largest one is our energy uh, projection for the year 2015-16. Now Stuart sort of highlighted how different people measure efficiency. So I'm going to talk about how, not how an economist measures it, but how I measure efficiency within my business. And for me, it's very much based on enterprise profitability. Um, we would look at return on capital, particularly for new ventures, uh, for new investment, and that's particularly relevant to some of the, um, some of the um, renewable um, section of our business. We measure efficiency endlessly in lots of physical ways. In our pig enterprise, we're measuring everything we can measure from a weekly basis, a daily basis, a uh, monthly basis, um, and all, all the different factors that we're, we can record, we are trying to record. And I suppose the key bit about these factors that affect my efficiency is some of them are internally within my control. 
and some of them are not within my control. They're external factors such as price, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And these external factors do affect my efficiency probably more <coughs> on an annual basis than anything we can do internally. But that's not to minimise the need to be as efficient as we can technically, or we don't survive. Six years, 2009 to 2015, um, that's the profitability. So dead easy graph to follow. Anything below the middle line is a deficit. Anything above the middle line is a margin. If I was to count up all these figures, plus and minus, and divide them by the six-year period that's there, we'd be making an average, I think it's of £1.35 per pig over that period. Now, given the turnover of our business and the value of a pig, that is not a good enough level to encourage us to keep investing in that sector. So the pig sector historically, and that's a six-year block, so it's quite a long time in the business life of a business, in the life of a business, to make financial judgments about. It makes it very difficult for us to keep having the confidence to reinvest. And you'll see some of the things we've done since then, which alter the um, choice of investment that we've made. And that's about the efficiency of the enterprise as such. So we've chosen to move into different enterprises where we think the return is more uh, controllable and will be less external factors influencing our decisions. Return on capital, as I said, tends to affect new enterprise because you're, you're actually, you can measure return on capital for, a, for an existing enterprise, but it's actually not that helpful because you can't change it. You've invested the money. So it's largely about looking at new ventures. And in our case, we have looked at a feed mill. Uh, this feed mill costs us about a million pounds. And we're using all of our own grain, but our own grain is only part of that. So we're buying in a lot of pr products, uh, cereals, and uh, protein and all sorts of other products in for that feed mill to operate. We hope that the provided we're efficient, and that's what today's debate's about, and you can't judge how efficient I'm going to be in there, but it, a lot of that efficiency there is based on turnover. It's based on tonnage out that mill every month. We're planning to put out 1,200 tonnes, which is not a big commercial mill, but it's quite a large farm milling operation. And we'll be milling now all of our own feed for all of our pigs in the central Scotland area. Um, we've invested a lot in renewables. This particular turbine was put up five years ago and its uh, initial loan term comes out at the end of next year. And after that, it will start to generate some profitability. We've invested in, um, we've got another turbine going up before the end of the year. So by the end of this year, we will have uh, electrical generation and turbine wind turbine capacity of something like 375 kilowatts. That one you were looking at is 275. And we'll have about 300 kilowatts of solar production capability. Now, these are not big enterprises. And you saw from the size of the wedge on the pie chart of turnover. But I could guess that the profitability which these enterprises will generate, and remember I make nothing out of them until the payback period is finished. But after the seven to eight year period of the payback for these renewable ventures, they have the potential to generate quite a high level of profitability to my business. And they will not suffer the irregularity of income that we're suffering in the pig business, for example. You saw these peaks and troughs and the profitability and the variability in profitability through that period. And that's a very significant factor when I talk later about this political macro umbrella which I think our industry needs to have provision to make us uh, survive. Now these are some of the internal factors or some of the um, elements that make up a, a pig's cost of production. In this particular example the cost of production was 134.6 pence a kilo. That's a dead weight price. Today's uh, price for example is about 126.6 pence for a standard pig product and um, you can see that that would be putting it into deficit. About 60% is, uh, is the approximate cost of feed, just to give you an idea. The column on the left is percentage. The column on the right is pence per kilo to make up that 134.6 pence. Labour is a big part of, of that cost. In a breeding farm, it would be nearer to 11 to 13% or 14%. In a finishing site, it would be less than that. So that's an average aggregate of 
a whole production system. I put in electricity just for interest because I did say to you that we'd installed or invested a lot of money very heavily in uh, electrical generation. You think, well, why, why does a core pig business invest in electricity? It's because of the potential stability of that income earnings for the future. We have a signed off government scheme that tells us that we will get X pounds, provided we do our bit physically and, and do it reasonably well and keep these machines running, we will generate a greater level, level of profitability. Our electrical cost is about um, two pounds and 10 pence per pig that we produce. So it's not the biggest cost there, but you can see that by taking our own feed manufacturer into our own hands, there is a potential that we can maybe make some savings there too. I'm going to run through just two or three examples of factors which influence um, profitability, if you like, or, or, or greater margin. I shouldn't talk about profitability. I should say it reducing the, the marginal deficit <laughs> or indeed <laughs> potentially producing some, some profit. So pigs per sow per year are the classic figures that everybody talks about. Now I'm going to show you two columns. One is the average UK production and the other one on the other side is the top third. I couldn't get half to print on there very readily without taking up too much space. So that's the top third against the average. And even just looking at the two, you can see on numbers of pigs weaned per sow per year that that's worth 5.8 pence per kilo. So that's quite significant. Oops, we've gone the wrong way, I'm sorry. Feed conversion ratio, a much, much bigger issue about feed efficiency, because feed, we said, was 60% of the cost of production. So if you move from average position to top third position, the saving potential is 7.2 uh, pence per kilo. That's not the figure at all. There it is there. 7.2 pence, sorry, it just jumped as I spoke, I beg your pardon, sorry. And then daily live weight gain is, is, is important, but not quite so important as feed uh, efficiency um, and that gives you a total on these three factors of moving from uh, average to top third of something like 14.6 pence per kilo now that's life and death to a pig farmer really quite a critical life and death so it's very important that all these physical factors these physical efficiencies we're talking about today are put in place on a daily and regular basis and there's no scope to miss out on these in my business, for every plus and minus, and remember it's plus and minus when it's, when it's plus, we, uh, our business moves £50,000 per year. Every single penny per kilo dead weight. Now, pig price can move 10 pence in a, in a period, of, period of months quite readily. Plus or minus £10 per tonne of feed is approximately £160,000 per annum in our business. So these are big figures and you can see how our profitability can surge and flow very readily. And that creates a real sense of discomfort for a business like ours trying to decide where the investment will go. I've said to you in the last five years we've invested more in, in renewable technology than we have in new pig facility. Now for a core business or a business whose core is in pig production I find that quite sad. And there are a heap of reasons why I think it makes it difficult for us to invest seriously in good technical equipment for the future because we don't have that confidence level and some of the reasons I'll come to in a minute. I think we don't have, for example, in the UK what I call this macro-political umbrella. We need to know our government cares or the people who are in control of our sector in the UK really care deeply about our UK pig sector. We require all the scientific support of you guys out there each one of you have got to contribute to improving my feed, uh, quality feed, the diets I use, the feed efficiency that we can achieve, even the housing and every other factor that we do uh, in our business. If there's heaps of little elements of it there. Each of these elements are terribly important that we have good science developed in the UK that's going to push our industry forward, not just the rest of the world, because the rest of the world will look after itself. We need good genetic progress. Some of that is, is um, traditional genetics, if you like, which is where we've been probably most of the last 40 years. Much of it is moving on to new gene marker uh, analysis. And it, each of these companies require, each of these businesses require large international businesses to be able to make that investment for the future. 
So there's going to be quite a change in terms of how we make that, uh, that genetic progress. I've put in, not to be contentious, but including GM technology. It's terribly important that everybody thinks GM's a screwy thing and it's going to upset everybody. Goodness me, we've been modifying genes for years. One of the, one of the, the, the really favourite um, spring barleys that was used for malting for many, many years, and it was a market leader for about probably 20 years, it was produced by irradiation. Now, how much more random can that be in terms of knowing what you've done to the whole plant and the whole makeup of the, the amino acids in that plant? I don't understand how people think the protein structure stays the same necessarily. It's important, I think, that in, in genetic modification we know what we've done. If, if it's wrong, we can take it back out and we can, we can change it. At least you, it's more controlled and much more measured than the random processes that we've gone through in the past. So I think me, for one, believes that we need to have a political structure that encourages good science, good technology, and supports my sector, and makes me feel that uh, my industry is important for uh, food production in the future. External factor, the, the euro, um, you can see the graph hasn't, I must have done shuggled it or so, did something when I, when I cropped it down a little bit, but it doesn't really matter. I think you can follow it quite easily. The top line is 2015, the middle one's 214, the bottom one's 213. So you can see quite a say, substantial difference between three years there. Now, you, my marketplace is <coughs> in the Eurozone primarily. We do export pigs to China and we do send pigs elsewhere. Uh, we're, we're sending some to Indonesia in, in January. But most of our business is influenced by Eurozone. And the, the difference between 214, just take a midpoint July, between, uh, is 12% between July from 215 to 214, and tw minus 21% for two, 215 and 213. Now, 12% affects my pig price by 15 pence a kilo. It makes it very difficult for me to export gilts into a, European, a Euro market. It makes it easier for my competitors to import into, into the UK market. So a simple thing like a euro to pound rate is really quite life and death for us. And it just it makes our business very difficult to retain that stability. Now you could argue politically maybe we should be in the Eurozone. That's, it's, I, I think in, in many cases my temptation would be to say we should be in Eurozone. Um, because it creates one less instability in my external factors. You can judge reading through some of this. I'm not very happy with my political masters. The, the year um, 99, in fact, uh, we had this rather unilateral UK legislation that took out South Stalls and Tethers. Now, everybody thinks that um, Europe is now reharmonized in terms of South Stalls and Tethers. But in Europe, you're allowed to keep sows in stalls for 28 days after service. So when embryos are beginning to implant in the uterus, then that's a very critical time for stability of these embryos. And that affects the efficiency of production that, that, that we can achieve. Now, I'm not allowed to do that here. I can't keep my pigs in stalls for that 28 day period because our legislation is different. Now that costs me, I think, about one and a half pigs per sow per year. Now that's worth something like around, for my business, if you take a pig at £20, which is a pretty notional price for a pig, I have 2,750 sows and that's £82,500 a year. Now that doesn't really make me more efficient economically than my competitors. We have an NVZ. Um, regulation in the UK, in Scotland here, which uh, only permits me to put, I should probably preface that by saying with a regulation put in place about three or four years ago that said I had to store my slurry for six months. Now the logic of that was that I'd keep it and use it on crops when the crops were growing. Good plan, that's okay, that's quite scientific and quite sound. They then said I can only put 170 kilograms per hectare of ni organic nitrogen, which is my manure, pig manure, that's my slurry, onto my wheat crop. My wheat crop may require 220 kilograms of nitrogen, but I'm not allowed to top that up with my fertiliser that I've got, 
sitting there in the tank, free. So I have to ship that excess slurry off the farm to my neighbours at a cost, and I have to buy an artificial fertiliser to replace that product. Is that the kind of efficiency that our country needs? Is that the kind of efficiency that my political overlords are trying to make me inefficient? There's this legislative fear within my sector that we'll be asked to make changes all of a sudden, that we'll be suddenly asked to come out of firing crates. That's the next big welfare topic. We think it's wonderful to have green production, high animal welfare in this country, but you probably don't appreciate that we've lost half of our sow numbers since the year 2000 to now. So we've half the number of sows in the UK now that we had in the year 2000. Now my guess is that much of that started with the South Stolen Tether Ban. We've got a fear today that we might lose firing crates. Now what does that mean? It makes us uncertain about investing in particular technologies today. I'm also fearful that we might be asked to take animals off fully slatted, 100% slatted accommodation and have a certain amount of solid floor there. That's making me reticent about the kind of buildings that I want to build today to reinvest for pigs. And I don't want to get it wrong, so I tend to sit on my hands and probably don't do it. And that's not helpful. I need that confidence and reassurance to make my business as efficient as possible. Now, this is my presumption here, so don't take this as factual. So I'm going to put a little storyline to this that's maybe not true, but you just bear with me, will you? Between the year 1999 to 2000, that was prior to the South Stall ban. All the way from 90 to 2014, we made an a average um, carcass weight gain of about 17 kilos. So the carcasses are getting heavier all the time, so yes, you could say there might well be some extra feed cost or extra less efficient feed conversion ratio going from a carcass weight of uh, say maybe 56 to 80 which is about where we are now but it's interesting that line is dead straight of I, I haven't shown it here but the line is dead straight so it's interesting that between 90 and the year 2000 we managed to retain a very similar feed efficiency feed conversion ratio which is kilograms of feed for every one kilogram of pig meat gained so we managed to remain relatively constant, if you like, at that point. What happened in the year 2000? We introduced sow stalls. Many farmers couldn't afford to reinvest in new accommodation, so a lot of new farms came along and they were, it was a time when cereal prices were low and lo all the sows went outside. A lot of sows went outside. Today we have something like 40% of our UK sows are outside. Now for customers that want to pay for a green image, I've always said that if somebody wants a pig with five legs and purple head, I'll produce that, give me time, I'll get there eventually, but you'll pay for it. It's not the most efficient. It's a bit like brown eggs, white eggs story. But the customer pays for that. It's not legislative. I object to the legislation that's pushed me into a very inefficient place. So my efficiencies are much poorer in world terms. And in the world today, we are one of the least efficient pig production countries in the world in terms of technical performance. We used to be market leaders in 1970 when I started. Today we are lagging the rest of the world. So from the year 2000 the feed efficiency got worse and I'm guessing my story is that that was related to the sows moving outside, they're less efficient and then we reared them in straw barns which are much less efficient in terms of feed conversion and therefore we're not doing a credit to ourselves as a business, as a sector, and we're certainly not doing credit to world food efficiency if we want to think about, uh, you mentioned carbon footprints, but I just like to think of us in this country feeding our own people and not stealing food from the rest of the world. We have a world population that's going to increase by 2 billion by the year 250. And there will be, as I've said already, a huge demand for that extra food. And that's a challenge that requires us to become individually and corporately and collectively, the whole world over, 
much more efficient in terms of our food efficiency, food production rather, than we did before. I showed you uh, one of my slides on feed conversion was moving from average to top third, and it just happened that the difference was 0.5 of a uh, point of feed conversion. So that's 0.5 improvement in feed efficiency. If round the world today we made an improvement of 0.5 feed efficiency in the feed conversion ratio, we would be able to feed another 520 million people. Now that's not the 2 billion, but it's heading that way. So there's a lot we can achieve collectively within the world, but it requires everybody to do it. It doesn't require the UK to have the divine right to think that they can create legislation that makes their producers less efficient and yet import product to replace what we could produce here. We're probably something like around 56% um, self-sufficient in pig meat in the UK. When I was chairman of the Pig Strategy Council for, at that time, it was the Meat and Livestock Commission, um, we were something like around 68%. So that's the highest we ever got to in the UK. But we've drifted backwards quite considerably since then. And we could produce a lot more of our own food. And I think we have a, a national responsibility to be self, more self-sufficient. And that's, there's a great argument of a bit of international trade. But just consider this, for me at least. If we're importing food from another country, we're stealing their food. They've got people who need fed at home too. We need global efficiency. So we don't just need efficiency at my farm level, that's for me. And, I, and, and for my survival, that's important for me. But we need to have serious UK policies on future food production. And I, for me, I would like to see greater self-sufficiency too. But we need a more stable working environment and we need all of your scientific input and support to get us as efficient as we can. And I think together we can make a difference, but there are challenges for us. Thanks.